Okay. <laughs> All right. Bismillah then. Assalamu alaikum to live Rakato. Welcome to Mind Heist episode. Do you know what it is, bro? Oof, bro I don't even know. Is it 98? Uh, it's 99. 99. 99. Oh my God. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, what are we going to do next episode, man? Um, we'll have both our sons do it instead. <laughs> okay. This, the two Suleimans. That'd be great. Could, no, we need to have uh, the two younger ones because neither of them can speak yet. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, my son's not. My son's, I've, I, the pattern I've seen is he's slow at everything or he's quote unquote late uh, with everything. Oh, no. But, although it's all good. Like, I think people get stressed about, so, like, it's like, you know, it's that mentality of, oh, my kids got to get all A's in their GCSEs and they're like one year old. Uh, I'm not, I'm not into that, bro. No. <laughs> I'm not into uh, if I wasn't too, um, what's the word? If I wasn't too protective over my kids, I'd let him do the whole podcast, bro. I know people would want that and would listen a whole hour of him just talking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and him could speak about um, trading stocks. Yeah, maybe I get him to feature. I just won't have him on camera. We'll have a conversation. Mm. Let us know if anyone has any suggestions. It'd be nice to do something, but I don't really know. I think what we can do, bro, is live stream, um, I guess, on YouTube, live stream. And we just need enough people there to, like, give us comments, give us questions, give us stuff to talk about. And we just you do, like, a full, full live thing. How does that work? How do we live stream a Zoom call? Yeah, so we just... Uh, we do it through like OBS. It's definitely doable. You just need a software which will uh, send our image into YouTube. We can yeah. work that out, inshallah, as long as I've got... Fair enough. Uh, we might have to delay it a week, so we maybe don't do a week, an episode next week, but the one after, because uh, yeah. I, I need to make sure my internet and all that is up to speed. But yeah, inshallah. Okay. But 100 inshallah. episodes, man, it's quite a lot. I'm quite proud of us uh, in terms of just consistency and, you know... Like it, that's like two years worth basically of once a week. We mm. did it in what is it, three years, three and a half years? Yeah, yeah, about three and a half. Yeah, so yeah. that's decent consistency, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. That's why I think we, we get those, you know, 100,000 downloads an episode. Like, yeah, bro. <laughs> That's why, bro, they're paying for your flights to Turkey, bro. My <laughs> sponsored globe trotting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so for this episode, I thought what we would do, because you know, the last episode, uh, it was with uh, Hussein, my friend Hussein. Really good episode. I think people enjoyed it. Um, and we were talking about, obviously, bro, you know, you know, the only thing more popular than marriage to, as a topic is intercultural marriage. So I thought, <laughs> gotta hit, gotta put that in the topic in the in the in the episode title. Oh, yeah. But uh, ultimately, we also talked about, um, like, kind of being part of this. I want to say generation or just group of people who really they're so mixed that they don't have like a one culture. You know, they just have bits of many things, mm. and even. You know, even like, uh, let's say, a, a white person in England, growing up in England, they will still have elements of other cultures, mostly probably U.S. culture. Right. But yeah. Uh, but as for other people like Hussein, you know, he grew up in Jordan, but then he lived in um, he lived in the Gulf. He lived in uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Thailand. He lived in uh, Indonesia a bit. He lives now he's living in Turkey. Uh, his wife is Japanese. So his kids, you know, are really you know, they're, they're basically going to be able to speak probably four languages. So that's like showing how mixed they are. So, and he was saying, you know, I don't really raise them with any specific culture. Um, and, and it's just like, they're going to be an amalgamation of cultures. So I wanted to talk about that in this episode uh, by jumping off this email that we got. Uh, did oh. you read the, the email, bro? From, uh, no, I haven't. From the... the how, well, how did I want to say it? Oh, I think um, I read how I read like the beginning of it, and then I, I didn't finish because I didn't want to. I didn't want spoilers, bro. Ah, uh, okay. I didn't want spoilers. Should I read it then? Go on. 
Okay, so Sister says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank you for sharing all the beneficial discussions you are having on the podcast. May Allah reward you for that. I discovered your podcast recently, and I've been enjoying listening to it since then. As a North African born and raised in Europe, I also identified a lot with what you've been discussing. Do you like my narration voice? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not condescending at all. <laughs> oh, really? Is it like that? Go on, bro. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you've cut me off. Um, I was really inspired while talk, while listening to your latest uh, podcast with Hussein about Japanese Arab intercultural marriage. I particularly appreciated how you addressed the issue of not being bound to a culture. It is a topic I've been pondering on and struggling with my whole life. Even if more and more people find themselves in the same situation, I haven't found a lot of people discussing this issue as it is a neat, it's still a niche struggle. Uh, but I may be wrong about that. Being from Moroccan descent, born and raised in France, wo worked years in London and lived with a Bengali family, studied Korean and Japanese languages and cultures for 10 plus years, studied in Korea and finally now working in Tokyo. I've been attached to all those cultures uh, that I adopted aspects of into my lifestyle without being bound to, to any single one. I like being Moroccan, but my um, upbringing was so that I can only relate partially to some aspects of my Moroccanness. I feel like an alien and a chameleon at the same time. That's that's a quote for you. Um, oh, I would for me really specifically the yeah. UFO now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would really appreciate if you could address and discuss more about this topic on your podcast or maybe point out an episode that you, you already discussed on. I'm particularly interested to hear how you dwell more on what it means when dealing with family, when looking to marry someone, uh, and when raising a child. Actually, I don't think that not being bound to one culture is a bad thing in itself. Being that way, it feels like going against the tide of nationalism and tribalism, which our Prophet ﷺ strongly condemned. As Hussein expressed in your latest episode, because I'm not bound to one culture, the only thing that anchors me wherever I am, whatever happens, uh, whatever happens is my deen, um, et cetera, et cetera. I apologize, long email. Look forward to hearing from you. So that's the topic, bro. Mm. Sorry, my connection is acting up. Um, so I have to pre pre preface this. Why does it keep saying that? It keeps saying my connection is low. It prefaces by saying I haven't listened to that podcast yet, bro, mm -hmm. which is sad. Sad mm -hmm. times. But I plan to, inshallah. Um, that's a very interesting background, though, this this individual that's emailed us. Yeah. It sounds like they've they've been around a block. Yeah. And I'm surprised, um, like, if, if she's been studying... Japanese, Korean language and culture for 10 plus years, then mashallah, we might, must have some older listeners, mm. um, which I appreciate because I feel like the older people will keep us in check more than the younger ones, you know? Definitely at least older than 10 years old, mashallah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking like, I was, it's the kind of thing that you would study in uni. So if if she went to uni 10 years ago, then she's at least 30 or something. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you... I, I, I don't know how I, 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 I suppose it's difficult now that we're already married to start thinking about how we think about marriage and yeah. Um, but I mean, what, sort of firstly, bro, like I feel like you're, you know, this concept of third culture kid, right? Yeah. It's like you're a child of three cultures, meaning, for example, your parents from one country, uh, your mom's from one country, dad from another, and you grow up in a third culture as well, third country, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm exactly that, but you're not so much that in that, I guess your parents, you do have that, but you're Moroccan Tunisian. So it's kind of more similar. Um, but do you, like, do you relate to this a lot? Um, even though you don't have that typical thing where like, I don't know, your mom is like, uh, English and your dad is, um, Moroccan mm. and then you grew up in a, yet another different, you know, country. Um, it's hard because like my I wouldn't say my Tunisian side of that cultural at least I don't know I can't think of anything like culture is a bit of a weird one because some stuff is very overtly cultural uh -huh. you know some experiences and some norms that you have overtly cultural and some are a, m a lot more subtle and you don't realize that you've got them until there's a clash somewhere you know um, uh -huh. for example like you could have a cultural tradition that is very overt, like, oh, when you get married, this is the sort of thing that we do. This is, a, you know, um, or when something happens, this is the sort of thing we do. Mm -hmm. But then you might have a subtle thing that you don't really know you have until somebody suggests yeah. you do, you go, you know, a certain way about things. And you're like, oh, no, no, we don't do that sort of thing. 
Um, trying to think though. Yeah, maybe because my Tunisian family isn't that big that I haven't had that much pressure towards it. But like my Moroccan, like when I think culture, I automatically think Moroccan. Uh-huh. Um, I, I I feel like I, not that I associate more with that, but like I enjoy exercising that more. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, no, but the, the thing is, we've, you know, lived most of our life in the UK. And because of that, we don't really have anything definitive. Um, I suppose we are a bit more... Um, uh, blank slate sort of thing um but i suppose there's a lot of things about british culture that you have in, within us and we don't realize we have and you don't realize that until you try and live you know a few years or a few months in, over in north africa you know something as simple as like queuing bro queuing up i just get laughed at for queuing up i'm gonna be there in the post office forever if i if i try and queue up <laughs> well, la, la, <laughs> <laughs> bro honestly and i just mm. you know i had to recently accept that like the only way i'm going to survive out here is if i start behaving like them so i'll mm. start crossing the road before the cars let me you know I, I won't queue up unless there's like a you know an elderly person or whatever but if it's if we're equals it's the best man wins bro yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> Are you really willing to it, run a man over today? Uh, I can't help it. You know those little like um, little corner shops where they only sell like tobacco, milk, that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, little minor things. Like, yeah, I step in there, and it's like a meter by a meter, and I'm stepping in there. I'm waiting for for the guy in front of me to sort of finish, and I'm standing there. And he finishes, and people are just going in and coming out, going in and coming out. Like I'm just standing there, looking like an idiot. Yeah. I can't bring myself to buy in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and I, yeah. I, I, unless he acknowledges me, I just can't do it. Yeah, this but, is this is culture, bro. Like culture is not traditions. Like traditions is like I don't know the clothes you wear at your wedding. The man's supposed to wear this. The, yeah, the bride so. wears this. That's a tradition. But a culture is much wider than that. Like a, a culture is like you said in in the UK there are British traditions. Like how polite people are. How people say sorry in every single sentence. Nearly, <laughs> you know this yeah. stuff. I was, you know, I've not I've picked up on it right because I have a lot of calls with different people you would say most of them from the uk and whenever like we talk at the same time um i usually my reaction would be i, I just go silent and i wait for them to to then yeah. continue um but what the, the thing that uh i noticed british people say a lot is they like obviously there's that awkward moment and then they'll say oh sorry and then they say uh, sorry uh, no i was just gonna say yeah, yeah. this exact phrasing I hear it again, again. You say it, bro, bro by the way. I noticed Probably. it from you. I noticed it from so many people. I was like, wow, it's like the exact same wording. So even that is like part of culture, you know? So I think, you know, as Muslims with this with this traditional, um, not tradition, with this kind of uh, the way that young Muslims are discussing culture, we need, I think we really need to understand what it is. And, and I think that's missing a lot from the discussion on, you mm. know, when people say culture versus Islam, right? I think yeah. they're thinking more like, traditions versus islam but yeah. culture is is way bigger than that bro like just the fact that like maybe you and i we were raised with a uh, game boy uh, color you know game boy was was out when uh, when we were kids and stuff um, oh yeah that that's part of our culture right that's part of yeah, um, yeah. what we know uh pokemon cards like that's part of culture so it, it, it's uh, it's wider you know it's a wider definition basically mm. yeah I think it, it, it also encroaches, I say encroaches, it's part and parcel of how um, Elm is transmitted and how Islam is sort of taught. Um, mm-hmm. I, I recall there's this, um, I'm not going to say who he is, but there's a sheikh from Saudi and um, he speaks English as well. And he, he often answers a lot of stuff in English online. Mm-hmm. Um, but he'll answer it in a very upfront, sort of blunt way. Yeah, and people get easily offended, and I sort of I was intrigued as why he he was like that. Mm. I can't remember who I spoke to, but someone from that neck of the woods explained to me like this is perfectly normal. This is how like, for example, <clears throat> somebody said to me, I can't remember who it was. It could have even been you, but somebody said to me like when you're sitting with um with somebody of knowledge, um usually they just give you like a yes or no sort of yes, you know, is this permissible? Yes, it is when you move on sort of thing yeah um and, it, and it, it, apparently i don't know if how legitimate this is but apparently like to ask somebody for their sources or to to like challenge them or to be offended by how you know straightforward mm. they are apparently yeah. is quite um it's quite rude over there so when you're when yeah. you're when your stu- when your teacher tells you you know yes you know or this is wrong and boom and then doesn't really doesn't really uh sugarcoat it or whatever and doesn't make it all uh yeah friendly mm. 
and that's why like there was this there was this issue like people had this issue about like um shiuch from you know the east or whatever you want to call it from the arab world or the muslim world being more blunt and they didn't they couldn't they weren't finding it receptive enough yeah um, so that's why they were they were drawn to more speakers and, and yeah, yeah. from from this neck of the woods yeah bro like it's it's disrespectful in many parts of the world to ask the faqih for his sources like like who are you bro <laughs> like do you even understand that the hadith if i'm going to quote the hadith to you like yeah. do you even understand that and then do you if i explain to you the usul al-fiqh reasons behind this ruling are you even going to understand like who yeah. are you it's not you it's not within your right to to for me to ask me to say this i'm the person yeah. of authority here it's not an, a, an arrogant thing by the way like like a lot of the scholars they would you know maybe they'd be like they'd find it strange but they, they might yeah. explain their reasoning right but for, for you as the asker the person asking with no knowledge um you know you should kind of know your mm. place and mm. and again that's culture isn't it bro because mm. in the in the west there is a culture of um, less hierarchy, less uh, gap between people of authority, whether that's parents, whether that's teachers, they're much, they're brought down a lot, isn't it, to more to, closer to the level, more, you could say, uh, democratization of pretty much everything. Whereas, you know, in, in other parts of the world, you know, like, I don't know, like Malaysia, you know, parents are still really up there and elders are really up there and stuff like that. Like, you know, mm. Uh, good example you know in english is there really a word for like ammo like i know i you know sometimes i, I they call just my, say paternal uncle or maternal uncle don't they they don't no no but i mean i i mean not someone who's family someone who's just an elder oh uh, you know? no there's, yeah i wouldn't say there is yeah but in in many uh, other languages there would be something like that i think traditionally they did maybe they said the word uncle i'm not sure um or they might say sir or something i don't know but um, it's not used anymore. So that's a reflection. Language and culture, like, they intersect, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, bro, even, uh, like you're saying, uh, when I came here to Turkey, I was... Um, I've never really come to the non-old city or the non-historic um, part of Istanbul. So, you know, he, around here, like, the roads are a bit bigger. And, and I found myself thinking, okay, how do I cross the road here? Is it... Is it a UK one or is it an Arab one? You know, yeah. <laughs> so um, at first I thought, you know, this is Turkey, like it's supposed to be like, it's like organized and stuff, but it turns out it's Arab, bro. So um, <laughs> if I'm willing to this stand is. in front of a car, then he has to stop. And that's how it goes. That's how it uh, goes. Yeah. Especially if you've got a pram, that'll just stop the whole road. Um, <laughs> but again, it's like you might, like, it, it's a good point you were making, bro, because um, in the UK, like walking into a road when cars are coming it's like uh you're wrong but yeah, yeah. here it might be like no no like as the driver i'm not annoyed at you like you were just you had to cross the road and that's how you have to yeah, do it yeah, yeah. you know you yeah. by you walking into the road you're letting me know that you want to cross the road kind of thing um and and it's it's uh, what you were saying about uh yes so in english we say please a lot i mean if you're polite uh, you're yeah. supposed to say please a lot, right? Uh, please, can I have that? You go to the shop, you go to the butcher. Okay, please, can I have one kilo, this, this, this? But in other languages, they don't really have the word please or they don't use it much, you know? So, mm. uh, like, uh, I, I remember thinking about this years ago in the UAE. You know, you, you find people go to the shop, they say, jib this, jib that. It means bring this, give me this. There's no mm. please, nothing. Um, but you know, that's kind of, that's like normal. It's not rude. Uh, in mm. I asked one guy, I think he was from India, South India. I said, do you have a word for please? He said, no. It's like, we don't really even have a word for please. Just the way that we say, give me that, or can I have that? It's, it's, all, it's polite the way it is. Um, or in Algeria, you know, I say please. Like when I'm speaking Arabic, I say please a lot. But it's kind of, I feel like it's, I'm a bit weird, you know, in that sense. Yeah, it's a bit um, forced. But, but, but I still do it. And just because it just comes natural to me, that might maybe that's probably my my British side, right? Mm. Um, but uh, but you know, in Algeria, for example, some sometimes the way people say please is not using the word please. They say like, uh, waldik, give me this." Yeah, 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 yeah. They make dua yeah. for your parents, and then they say, "Give me this." Yeah. Uh, you can say like "lo samah." It's not very weird to say "lo samah," but it's not like everything you ask you're saying "lo samah, lo samah." You know. Uh, well, I think we say "min fadlik" a lot. Mm, that sounds Fadlik. like more fusha, yeah. I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it's from Tornus. Fadlik. 
I mean, it's yeah. normal, like, even if you say an error. An we also say, yeah, we say, Arham Weldik. Yeah. Say, Arham Weldik. But usually that's with a bit more emotion if you're like. Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, begging. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, we say, Bilahi. We say, Bilahi. Oh, okay, a lot. that's a new so one for we, me. Yeah, if we say, Yani, um, Bilahi, Jibli, this, or Bilahi, do this for me, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll say, Bilahi, a lot. Yeah, it's like with a, with a dua kind of thing. Or yeah. I don't know if you've heard this. Uh, I think this is like a Wahran thing, which is a city in Algeria. Uh, they say, Hambuk. Which is short for <laughs> yeah, Yarham Abuk. Abuk. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, Allah have mercy book. on your dad. But yeah. they just uh, shorten it, Hambuk. Yeah. So, um, by the way, a lot of people, you know, when I'm, I'm, I meet Arabs, they're always like, oh, you guys don't speak Arabic. It's yeah. actually sometimes it's from a lack of their understanding of Arabic. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of, um, like in the more Eastern side of the Arab world, they might say like bait for house. We say dar, but in Arabic, it's both, you know, accepted uh, words mm. actually i think in fusha dar is a house bait is a room i think so mm. anyway. so uh you know you find a lot of the words that we use that they don't use in the east um they're actually yeah. fully like from fusha you know fully yeah so, it's what it's it swaps because like the bedroom would say bait and norm so bait and mm. would say bait that way and then dar whoever would say house yeah yeah um, exactly. i'm trying to think of what else yeah, like in Morocco, they'll say, uh, like my mom will say, Yarham mm. Weldik. My mom say, Yarham Weldik? Yeah, I think they do. Mm-hmm. I always get confused because obviously I've got three now. And like my wife is making an effort to try and speak more Arabic in the house with the kids. Mm. But because because our Arabic has always been a bit different, we haven't really fallen into it naturally. Yeah. Um, but now because she is making more effort, I'm finding a bit of a bit of a clash in like what I understand to be. Because I'm always picking between either Tunisian or Arab or Tunisian or Arabic, Tunisian or Moroccan. Ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then she's throwing, she's obviously naturally, she's going to speak Algerian Arabic. So it's a bit mm. more like, mm. what is this? All my kids are going to be talking, man. They're going to be confused. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. think of Hussein's kids, right? He speaks to his kids in uh, Arabic Futha. His wife speaks to them in Japanese. And then they also oh, know bro. English. And then That's they're cool. going to learn a bit of Turkish, I guess, by living here. So. Mm. there's a lot going on for them but i can't speak i can't mm. speak fusha without making it funny man like that's the thing like i try i speak right. a, i i, I, re, I realize i know a lot more fusha than i thought i did because yeah. i'll do it as a joke and then i'll be like oh actually mm. that was a complete and and, and formed sentence there <laughs> <laughs> and then um and then yeah, i realized because a lot of it was subconscious because i grew up watching a lot of cartoons and stuff in arabic mm. and it's all there bro. and I, I i was showing some of my um friends that are a lot of them are from afghanistan but obviously they all want to learn arabic and stuff um and uh, who else was i showing i was showing musa you know musa adnan i was showing him uh what's it youtube clips of arabic tv shows and i think none of them realized that it was all for how they all thought it was based on wherever wherever it was you know produced or where it was developed yeah. so when I put it on, they were blown away, man, because they were like, oh, my God, this is proper Fusha, like Arabic cartoons, bro. Well, at least they're just dubs, aren't they? They're, they've been voiced over, but they're yeah. all, you know, Arabic, always yeah. going to be Fusha, bro. Yeah, they are. So I sometimes I put stuff like that on for my kid because mm. or even like now you've got like even on Netflix and, and all these sort of s- streaming uh, things, if you just change the settings, you you can just change it to Arabic anyway. Mm. Um, so as long as Arabic is being Dubbed heard within the house. Uh, dubbed some of them oh. are even dubbed bro mm-hmm. most of them are going to be subbed but some of them mm-hmm. have dubs like there was like some pokemon one the other day and yeah. i changed it to arabic and then couldn't didn't last that long because it's like getting really annoying but <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 exactly so and, and that's what kids need anyway that's what kids should be learning yeah, yeah. they're going to get the the normal dialect from their parents so mm. yeah but i i find the same like whatever you establish that you speak with your wife for example that's what you're going to stick with like it's yeah. very hard to change afterwards same with your kids yeah like, whatever you start with you're gonna stick with i actually got in the i i i got in the what's the word what's the word man uh i got into the the groove <laughs> sure yeah the mood uh, i got into the, the swing the, <laughs> the routine of speaking to oh, myself in, in, <laughs> in arabic yeah okay um, but I'm, but I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to be the one teaching him English. So I, I had to force myself a bit to speak to him in English. And, and now I do that and quite naturally. But yeah, uh, only because it was early on that I was able to change. Mm. So that's something, you know, important. So like we talk about culture, like culture is, is very wide. It's like how 
some things are polite and some things are rude. Like I was saying on, on the other episode, it's when an elder steps in the room, how do you react? That's culture, mm. you know? Mm. And in Islam, we have a the general thing, which is, you know, you respect your elders, but then, you know, how exactly do you show that respect? That's completely like orfi, you could say. Mm. So mm. this is the stuff which you can't say my, my culture is Quran and Sunnah because like Quran and Sunnah will literally dictate like maybe, I don't know, 15% of your actual like muhammalat like mm. 15% 20% i don't know but the rest it's completely down to your culture whatever it is that you do which is not comp- like dictated by the religion specifically that's culture mm. you know so i'm trying to think what i'm trying to think of actual practical examples though um of what like like of where we're filling holes in with our culture everywhere know? bro i can't think of like, it, like do you sit on the floor to eat do you sit at a table to eat okay one is you could say sunnah um right but it's, it's still allowed to sit on a table do you eat with your hands do you eat with the fork mm. do you what food do you eat um do you food like, is, yeah food i guess like do you sit together and eat as a family or does everyone just eat whenever they can, but know, these can. aren't things that are isolated to where we're from these are things that exist even in you know in europe European cultures like some eat on their own some yeah but yeah but still part of what defines your culture yeah I guess so right maybe maybe I find it difficult because we're I think that's what it is because I'm not I'm not like set in any particular format that I find it all a bit exactly a bit thin, that's the know? position that we're in where yeah. we're doing pick and mix basically mm. like when you got married okay you had, and then you you went and you lived on your own in your own house. Mm. It was completely up to you, the cultural norms you create in your house. Yeah, true. You know? And and you must have gone with whatever either was you were just used to, or whatever mm. seemed just morally correct, or whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? And that mm. and now you've created your own house culture, like whatever you do in your home, that's your culture, isn't it? And it'll be a think. mixture. <clears throat> Trying to think now that we are in our own house, which we have been in a long time for a long time now. Yeah. Trying to think, what is it that like might separate my house from like my in-laws' house? Okay, one thing I don't like is like when the TV is on all the time. I know yeah. that's really minor, but like one thing I noticed in my in-laws' house is like they'll leave the TV on even if nobody's in the room. Mm. Like I'm, I don't, I don't get that. That yeah. always stresses me out. I'm like, if nobody's in the room switch it off yeah. maybe that's just because we used to save electricity <laughs> we used to we used to be very like oh if, if we don't need it on we're not having it on sort of thing um but yeah that was but that's all i could think of <laughs> i'm mm. trying to think of more things uh subhanallah yeah a lot of i suppose a lot of families still eat together um i don't like yeah i don't i don't i find it weird if people just eat separately or whenever they want one yeah. thing that i'm trying to bring back into my um, into my house here that was to be done more when I was at my mum's, mm. like eating all from one plate. So yeah. my wife, me and my wife started trying to do that, like more meals. Mm-hmm. And I've always preferred that, bro. As soon as yeah. I did that, bro, I just felt, you just feel like, you feel warm, bro. You feel like mm-hmm. there's barak in this, bro. Like mm-hmm. we're sharing from one plate, it's nice. Yeah. As opposed to like everybody with a different plate. I'm not, I don't like that. So yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, that, honestly. that's something I didn't do growing up um, with my parents. Oh, really? But now I do. You know? Yeah. So again, that's that's like part of our culture that we're creating for ourselves. Mm. Um, and you could say, yeah, that is from you know the the religion, definitely. Mm. But sometimes it's hard to separate from the religion from the culture because people are eating from one plate. For example, in Algeria, everyone eats from one plate. But if you ask them why you eat it from one plate, some of them will say it's sunnah, it's the baraka, and some will say, oh, I don't know, we just do it like this you know yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so it's hard to say that is from just the culture the truth is the culture was influenced by the religion and mm. it created that culture some people know where it comes from some don't isn't it but some stuff like that some stuff we will do now obviously that we picked up on just by being maybe more so in the west is that you know like things to do with like recycling or, or, or global awareness or yes you know what i mean the environment stuff like this which is a shame because we should be at the forefront of it in the muslim world and, yeah. and to be fair there are some yeah, you know, there's some instances now, even when I go to like, it's not like unknown for people to to do that sort of stuff. However, in more rural areas, it's less sort of popular, I'd argue. I could be wrong, could be an assumption there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like, you know, re, maybe recycling and re, or, or avoiding stuff that's going to create waste or yeah. that kind of thing. Um, 
I'm quite conscious about that. But mm -hmm. that's because, you know, every few weeks, every few months, there's like a new documentary or a new article comes out or something mm -hmm. about, you know, the, way, the amount of waste we produce and, and what it's doing to the environment and what it does to the wildlife and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but some people don't care, he like drives me up the wall, bro. You would just be driving and you see people just chucking stuff out the window. Oh my God, it, it absolutely frustrates me. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that. And you see, obviously, um, you know, you see it in Muslim countries quite a lot. Um, I think it's less socially acceptable here for people to just throw rubbish in the street. I know like Japan, for example, is insane. Like to see anything on the floor, people mm. that I've read somewhere, they don't even have, they don't even have, um, like what's the word refuse bins, like, you know, like bins in, in, in public because people yeah. just take their rubbish home with them apparently. Um, <laughs> wow. and it's rude to like eat and walk, like yeah. eat, like to eat something and be out and about you either sit at a place to eat it. Yeah, or you obviously eat at home, but like just eat something on the way somewhere, whatever. I could be yeah. completely wrong. I just I remember reading this somewhere, but yeah, like I was seeing, I was uh, not too long ago, I was watching some videos from Japan, um, and not just like the city areas, but like some rural areas as well, and you know, places in between. I remember it was like spotless. I just found it crazy how spotless everything was. Um, it's insane, really. I think it might come from the schooling system because in school, I think all the kids clean the school themselves. Mm -hmm. so they learn that that's their responsibility to keep the, the school clean and stuff and then that might pass on like if they've been doing that for generations then you know and obviously they've got a what do they call it uh, the opposite of like an individualist society they've got a community com communal so yeah. society so they they always think of like the greater good and what's better better for the group and the society at large Mm. Uh, as a default, Yanni. So yeah, for sure. I'm, th this is all culture, isn't it, that we're talking about, mm. like mm. Um, whether you recycle or not. Now you could say, okay, but the dean should tell you to do that. But that's what I was trying to explain is that uh, the dean and culture is, is inseparable. Uh, in normal circumstances, it's kind of inseparable. Like yeah. what, mo like... Um, but you've got, you've got to look at what the yeah. dean came... <clears throat> and abolished you know there were certain things about arab culture that the dean came and abolished yeah. you've got to remember like islam was islam isn't arab culture islam modified arab culture like it will modify a lot of cultures yeah. you know it comes to i mean mm. one could argue that part of arab culture was um i don't know maybe possibly uh you know, dismissing you know women or, or or not wanting to have daughters or all this other stuff do you know what i mean like you know there's a narrations yes. of people burying their daughters alive that was part of arab culture yes. um you know <clears throat> flipping um you know having having loads and loads of of wives or the way they treat them or not, not giving them their honor or their rights or whatever um and oh, lots of things lots of things yeah. and it came Fighting to abolish a lot of that yeah. and tribalism yeah. and all that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so definitely so the religion came and, and removed certain things and we need to be careful of those things that you know might be normal and we're yeah. doing it and then we need to remove it yeah, uh, think but, of like um, mm. a non muslim like um, sorry, like a British Muslim revert. You know, mm. there's a lot of things that Islam is going to remove that are part and parcel of their culture. Like I don't know, so, um, you know, going to the pub, mate. I know that the going to the pub is is like a, a laughable thing to us, but it's like part and parcel of people's cultures. Like even um, you know, even with the colleagues at work and stuff. Like it's just absolutely fundamental. That's why mm. people are losing their minds when these these lockdowns come through and like the pubs are closing <laughs> and stuff. People just don't know what to do with themselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, uh, what was I going to say, man? Like, yeah, that's it. I think some of the discussions I've seen uh, when it comes to religion and culture and or religion versus culture is that I think a lot of people are thinking that uh, everyone, every Muslim who's living a good Islamic lifestyle will be doing everything with a, a referenced hadith in their head. But that's, you know, not what I believe ever was the case or will be the case. It's not mm. that I'm going to pray, uh, not forget, okay, putting prayers aside. I'm not going to uh, share my meal with a random guy on the street because of specific hadith in my head. I might do it, though, because that's what I was taught to do. That's what I was raised mm. to do in my culture. So a lot of the Islamic, you could say, acts and the acts we do, which are encouraged in Islam, in a normal circumstance, we would do that because it's just the way we do things. We know what's good and bad from general mm. teaching, not from a fiqh class, not from a hadith class. Mm. You know what I mean? So just because we do it, not knowing the quotation in our head, it doesn't mean 
it's oh now that is culture it's not religion or it's religion it's not culture no mm. like the act itself can be from the culture and from the religion but mm. i think the the area where you know it's culture versus religion is just when we have to remove some of those uh, un-islamic things obviously mm. but bro i want to get to the maybe the three points that she brought up so we just cover those three and she said i'm particularly interested to hear you dwell more on what it means when dealing with family looking to marry and then raising children so dealing with family mm. which is not something i do much of <laughs> to be honest oh, no. that's how you deal with it you deal with it by pushing it to the side <laughs> I'm trying to think dealing with family so you've got you've got like some uh, i think uh, uncles aunts cousins in the uk as well right yeah but we're not as we're not very family orientated um like we don't see each other a lot mm. um like bro like my cousin i hadn't seen him in like a year he hasn't even seen my kid yet and he's mm. one years old Wow. I bumped into him when I was working, like at four in the morning. Mm. <laughs> I, was, I was like, we were dealing with some guy and I saw him walking. And I was like, oh, I called him over. We had a conversation like whilst I'm working and it was really awkward. Mm -hmm. But it was like, oh, I just realized like our family is quite, despite the fact that a lot of us or most of us live in this city that we're in, mm. we just don't really see each other that often. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's because, I think part of that is because like the elders have sort of now, like, you know, my grandmother is not in the UK. She's in Morocco. My granddad passed away about 10 years ago, I think. Um, and they were going to, they were like the, the, the sort of the glue, you know, that if, if they're around, then everybody comes. Mm -hmm. You know, my grand, when my grandmother's visiting the UK, then everybody's like meeting up all the time. You know, we're always sort of mm -hmm. around each other. But then when those, when those sort of unifying figures kind of go, and now it's getting like that, you know, now since I've moved out, I'm even more, and I didn't realize it obviously happening, but I'm even more detached than some of other people because I'm like focused on being here with my kids and that sort of stuff. And, mm. you know, and I, I'd like to make more efforts sort of bring people together. But then again, this year has been quite, you know, this, this year has been quite a difficult one in terms of lockdowns, in terms of social distancing and stuff like that. Um, we don't really want to, you know, I personally don't want to be a hypocrite and start flipping uh, breaking rules and stuff and also my dad's not very well so don't want to risk him getting sick and stuff like that and my my dad and i don't know my dad but my mum especially takes it quite seriously and I, re I respect that because it's you know these these risks are out there um but i do see like my in-laws a lot um and i think they're they're a lot more family orientated um they're a lot more stronger with this culture i think because there's a lot of them here and there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh, different sort of figureheads, you know, uh, a lot of family orientated um, sort of uh, outlook. Uh, yeah, I definitely feel like their 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 culture is a lot more dominant and a lot stronger. Um, but stuff like that, like there's some stuff that they do, like my wife does all the time that I can't really get on board, which is like like ringing each other every day like calling each other i can't do that like that's too much for me you know like my my wife will call like five six seven different people every day like on facetime wow. as well like not even like you know she'll call her brothers and she'll call her mom and she'll call her dad and then she'll call someone in algeria and mm. then she'll call someone else in algeria and it's cool always i bro phone's always popping off and mm. i can't deal with that you know mm. and i'm you know there's some family members i don't speak to for years bro no <laughs> and they'll accept that that's fine like that's normal um it's not like there's any hard feelings when we do eventually speak to each other it's just the norm yeah you know? I think it's I a bit of a man-woman thing as well. Like women Possibly. tend to be, I mean, especially Algerian women, they love just talking and chatting and <laughs> so sociable. Yani, yeah. It's more important. Uh, it's a higher priority in their lives, uh, I think, yeah. I found, for women rather yeah. than rather than for men. So that's part of it. But it is part of the culture as well, like whether you're distant or close as a family. But like dealing with family, um, I think it's one like, I, you know, like personally, when I go like, because uh, obviously I've got my very close family, which mm. Yanni, we, we pretty much share the same values, generally the same culture. So there's not really a clash there for me. It's yeah. pretty harmonious. There's a bit of a, I, I, between me and my dad, for example, I, I wouldn't say there's like a big culture difference. There's a, not a big difference in terms of the way we want to practice Islam. The only difference is a personality difference, which is what yeah. you would get with someone in the same generation as you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't find like big clashes in that sense. 
Um, so now I have to think of like, okay, my family in Algeria, my family in Algeria. Um, yeah, like it's obvious I'm different, but we don't bump heads, I would say. And because I'm, when I go to Algeria, I'm kind of like the guest there. So if there's any clashing of heads, I'm kind of just going to keep it low key and stuff and, you know, avoid mm -hmm. anything, but I can't even think of examples. And again, maybe that's because Alhamdulillah, my family generally they're on the same wavelength as me mm -hmm. um you know i can think of a one instance where my cousin was getting married and they wanted to have music at the wedding and my uh the the, the my cousin who was getting married his brother-in-law so his sister's husband he was not not really on it so he kind of came but this is the thing they respected it so much that i think they didn't put music on uh for the for the first bit of the wedding so mm -hmm. he would be comfortable and stuff and they kind of respected it sometimes that kind of you know situation goes uh, goes negatively uh, very negatively um and then like when he just left and stuff and he's like yeah you know i want to go home early anyway and it, so that was like that was not that was between two algerians born and raised in algeria you know mm. so it's like um there are cultural differences within countries as well yeah uh but yeah, I, I can't speak too much on dealing with family, any clashes. Mostly mm. it's like same wavelength. I feel like, you know, there's a difference between me and maybe my close family as well in terms of I have this culture now of business and entrepreneurship. That's kind yeah. of it's a bit of a new thing for maybe for, for the close family. So um, that's something new, like the fact that I, I don't have a job. Instead, I have a business and I kind of uh, work from anywhere and I work online and you know, this is a new thing, uh, definitely. And that makes me a bit different, uh, but mm. even with my in-laws, it's something maybe new to them, but yeah, no specific like clashes or anything, but I think mm. it's, it is tricky, bro, because sometimes, you know, you'll have family members who are doing something which is, you know, completely wrong, even to yeah. the level of who knows, like drinking alcohol, who knows, like something very big, um, taking loans. And I think, you know, for me, at least when I think of it, I think of approaching it with like, okay, the ties of kinship must be kept mm -hmm. at all costs. Very, very important. Like you got to see the big picture and the big picture is, you know, we have to have good family ties. Um, but then there's also needs to be, I think it's like, it's difficult when you, you, your family sees you growing up and you're a certain way, and then you want to become a bit more, mm. you know, stricter or serious, let's mm. say not stricter, but serious. Then they'll be like, oh, what's this kid? So you got to like um, set, give yourself a reputation where it's like, yeah. look, this guy's cool. Like he's chill. He's not uptight. You don't want to be the uptight guy, but he will, uh, he will, um, what's it called? You know, advise people when they're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And and then when you advise, you don't try and control them. You just advise. Yeah. And mm. that's important. You know, some people try and control, like they, they come to their, you know, second cousin's wedding and they want to shut down the whole music. And it's like, okay, firstly, you're like my second cousin. Uh, secondly, like I, I see you like once every two years, like we don't even have a strong relationship. That's not how it's going to work. You know, you need to have mm. good relationships with all the people. Then they'll respect what you're saying. They might listen, they might not listen, but you can't come and, and try and control what's happening. You can advise and do what you can and then if you have to leave and stuff like that but it mm. all i feel like it always just comes down to building the relationship from the get-go to be positive and that's mm. time consuming but i think that's the way the professor Salem wanted us to be like just having good relationships with with you know the people in our family and the people like neighbors and stuff so then when you do try and give that nasiha it has more holds more weight mm. and people know that you're not trying to just um control them but you're actually concerned for them you mm. know I don't, the process when i read about how he so dealt with the family like his wives his kids or his neighbors or the sahaba everybody knew he wanted the best for them mm. you know even when i think it was ibn masarud he kicked him when he was on the ground because he was lying on his belly and it, when he kicked him ibn masarud would have known that it's because of something he wants good for me yeah so that's kind of maybe what we have to aim for I suppose when it comes to the, the deen, though, it's, it's it's kind of where people position themselves. Like some people, 
that I've spoken to, they see the Dean as part and parcel of where they're from and the culture that they grew up with. Uh-huh. So their understanding of the Dean is often very, it's one way cultural sort of thing, you know, because instead of them saying, instead of them, like we were mentioning earlier, like what's the, what's the Hadith or what's this, or this is the Hadith we're referencing. They'll say, oh no, that's not how we do it back home. You know, that's not how we do it. You know, that's not how we do it. As in we being yeah. what, Algerian or Moroccan or Tunisian, whatever, yeah. you know, uh, a good example is like, uh, uh, the niqab, like, um, the niqab is often seen as, especially in North Africa, it's seen as a, a very Saudi, a very Khaliji thing. That's not what we do here. That's not what, do you know what I mean? But like, you know, my wife could argue, well, no, I'm, I'm wearing it because the Dean says in, in this particular, you know, this is the reference I'm using and this is where yeah. it cuts from. But, they, but she'll get pushback. She'll be like, no, that's not how we do it. You know, that's not how we, and we being, yeah. you know, that's not how we practice Islam. Yeah. Right? Islam is, is, is this, and I'm sure Turkey is probably similar. Like Turkey is probably going to have that clash between what they consider, you know, uh, how they practice their Dean. And, and, and it, was a, it was a similar thing. Um, where was I? I was speaking to a brother from a friend of mine who lived here and he went to Egypt. I've mentioned him a few times. He was saying how he was finding big issues with the, the, um, the thobes. So he used to like wearing his thobe a bit higher. So it's, you know, below the knees, but like middle of the shins. And he was getting so much grief about that mm-hmm. because they wear it a lot longer. Um, and apparently there's like a big thing about, you know, where, how, how high your, your thobes is. And if it's too high, they consider you like a bit of an extremist or from yeah. another part of the woods or something like that. And not yeah. Egyptian or, my my general approach to these things, I just remembered a real example with was with my beard in Algeria, where mm. some of my family members were like, sometimes in a jokey way, sometimes in a bit of a more direct way, like saying like, why does it have to be that long kind of thing, right? Mm. Um, my general approach is like, just laugh it off and just be like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, like... Um, Funny joke. <laughs> no, like, I, because uh, I, no. I kind of, I always try and empathize, so they're coming from a perspective which I don't have, which is that, like you could say it's wrong no, nonetheless, but you have to still empathize and be like, okay, the, the context that they grew up in uh, dictates that the beard, this long of a beard is a bit weird, firstly. Secondly, it's linked to certain negative things. So mm. you've got to understand and respect that. You don't have to comply. Obviously, it wasn't so bad that they were saying, you know, I'm not going to talk to you if you keep that beard or something like that. Yeah, but yeah, I think yeah. generally try to try to fit in, uh, try to fit in with the people. Don't try and stand up for the sake of it. Like, don't try and cause conflict when what you, the thing that you're doing is a sunnah. You know, it's, yeah. it's a sunnah. It's not something that's followed or anything. For the sake, I feel this is just my approach, Yanni. In order to keep the harmony and to get closer to those people, if you're an outsider, like you're coming to Egypt from outside, then if they find the th- shorter thobe weird then I feel like a good way to just keep the harmony with them, make them feel like, yeah, you're not an outsider. You can have a good relationship with them is mm. to have it longer, but still maybe above your ankles, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe that's like a middle ground where, y- you know, you know what I mean? So I think general, some, yeah. I think some people absolutely thrive off that. You know, I think we're guilty of thriving off that sort of, um, you know, lone wolf kind of thing. Um, yeah. Kind of like I remember we, when we started practicing, like we just, when I started practicing, but I was just doing some like, I was, I was giving some really hard headed stuff for no reason just to make a statement, you know. And mm. I, I remember doing yeah. that. I remember, you know, I remember, bro, like walking down, walking. I went, where did I go? I went to, bro, like most, like predominantly working class white sort of area, <laughs> like supermarket dressed in like, like full thobe and kufi, like down here, bro. Like, this not, you know, maybe in London yeah. you can get away with it in certain areas, yeah. but down here, and I don't know what, why I was like, <laughs> doing that mm. i didn't do it for a long time but yeah sometimes we the... do it i think i think i'm probably guilty of this i do it to feel better than those around me you yeah know? possibly uh which is uh, a shame you know um, possibly so so you know like for example even when i go to algeria sometimes i'll pray the way they pray because i know it's like an acceptable way of praying just to fit in you know um mm. and i know deep down I can I can stand out. I'm quite comfortable with standing out. You know, anyone that mm. comes from like mixed cultures and stuff, they're always standing out anyway, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I know I'm not doing it out of being a coward. I'm just doing it because I want people to feel like, yeah, okay, he's whatever, he's Algerian, he plays yeah. like us. You know what I mean? So as long as there's nothing wrong with it, obviously. Yeah. Um, so that's like dealing with family. What about like when you're looking to get married? Um, and it's like 
I think what the sister said is very, you know, relevant is that because you're a mixture of many cultures, it's very like there are there are millions of hundred percent Moroccan people. There are millions yeah. of hundred percent Malaysian people. But how many are there of people who are okay Moroccan, but then they're influenced by Japanese culture and then Canadian mm. culture and this and culture, you know? Um, and so, how do you find a match with some, you know, like that? Um, I feel like <clears throat> that was something I was actively conscious of. Uh, you know, when I was thinking of getting married, and I think, alhamdulillah, I think I found a, a very good match for, um, in the same sense that the same sort of life experiences and the some of the mixtures that we have, we're very, you know, the same. Like, I was very conscious of um, marrying somebody that has kind of had a, a decent enough experience in a Muslim country, you know, not just like goes there for holidays, but has like lived there. Um, and, and alhamdulillah, that's exactly what I found, you know, someone who pretty much lived there in, in North Africa, either the same amount as I did or more um and not just that but like born here as well born in the UK and then sort of done that so the their the predominant culture is going to be the UK but you know with enough experience so if we were stranded out in the middle of you know North Africa we're not going to be stuck and we're not going to be panicking and all that sort of stuff yeah um and you know mixed cultures like yeah Moroccan and Tunisian are not that mixed in that sense but you know my wife's half English so there's that element of understanding that two different sides of the coin mm. are going to be behaving a bit differently you know yeah. um so it's 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 not hard to explain to her you know oh, this is where my my mom's family do things or this is where my dad's family do things or whatever and she, you know they've got that sort of element and understanding um and i think it's something important to think about mainly i, I don't know how it depends like how important it, that is for people um because I'd argue that you may be doing it more for other people like your family and stuff, like trying to basically find someone who's similar culture, cultural background to you. You're either doing it more for your family so that they're not, uh, so that there's a good an easy way of gelling there. So there's not a lot of a clash. For example, you know, uh, if you are North African and you're marrying someone from, I don't know, Indonesia, for example, um, and you're bringing them into a very North African family, there may be a lot of like difficulties there in trying to understand each other or trying to understand the way things are. Or there might, it might come with a lot of baggage, you know. Uh, your North African family are going to have a lot of misconceptions. But the thing is that that exists anyway, to be honest. Like that exists with us, bro. Like just neighbors. Like, you know, I grew up, I don't know why, but I grew up in Tunisia being told like Algerians like all of them are terrorists and stuff. I remember yeah, that, yeah. that was like a big, I remember that, that was a big um, sort of, um, it was, yeah, it was like, they used to say Khwanjiya, Khwanjiya, like obviously talking about Khwan Muslimin. And I don't know why that used to exist, but that was what I grew up thinking. Um, because that's what, not, not my not my mum and dad, but like my family in Tunisia and the Tunisians there. I remember spending two years there, bro. And I saw about, I just started hearing about Algeria and they always used to say that because I used to say this is why I came up conversation because I obviously I'm half Moroccan so I used to say um why can't we drive from Tunisia to Morocco like can't we just drive through to Algeria and they were like oh no you can't drive through Algeria it's dangerous mm. there's, there's you know terrorists and all that so I grew up with that kind of notion um and obviously I knew that like Tunisians and Moroccans loved each other but Moroccans didn't like Algerians and like uh, I think Algerians didn't like Egyptians or something like that. And there's all this sort of, and then Libyans, nobody likes Libyans or something like that. Like that was the way. <laughs> Bro. So there's always going to be these misconceptions. I think ultimately, you know, it, it, it may be important. It may be important, especially if you, if you value culture, if you value that element of it, and if you want some sort of level of cohesiveness and understanding, it's hard for me to speak from a different perspective because I went with down the route of marrying someone who is mm, relatively similar, similar to me. Mm. It, you know, I could have said, and I did have the opinion, uh, you know, that culture doesn't matter too much. Uh, you know, I could, I could essentially marry anyone who's Muslim and it should be fine. However, you know, I, there's certain things that me and my wife, like, uh, because I've married someone so similar to me and culturally similar, like, there's things I don't even think about. And just like that, like, we just both think the same thing. We expect the same yeah. thing. Um, so I don't know if I'd done anything else, would I be as content i don't think i you know there, there's a chance that i might not be yeah there's a chance that you could end up battling with and you see it actually like i see it now there's um there's there's marriages where 
for example, a good example is like um, people that married rebirths or and or people older generations. Like there's people that are even in my family. I remember they married people that um, became Muslim, and one could argue maybe became Muslim just for the sake of the marriage. You know, primarily as opposed to you know, I remember I had some uncles that went through the same thing, and like they, it doesn't last long because. The, the, the reason the dean came about was because of the marriage as opposed to the dean came first and then they found each other. So then when, when they're more comfortable with each other and time goes on, there's a clash because one party is drawn to the culture they came from and wants to go back to that sort of way of thinking and doesn't understand the importance of certain elements. And, you know, there's an element of like, you follow your husband wherever he goes sort of thing. And that doesn't necessarily exist in many cultures. Um, you know, like, I, I know that it's a big thing for... Uh, my sort of culture and like north africans at least like wherever the man goes the woman has to go in this sort of sense like whatever decision the man makes for the family that's where they're going but yeah. like i know here bro if you know in the uk bro if a woman doesn't want to do something bro she put a foot down she's not doing it do you know what i mean they're not going there um but it doesn't always exist like i said there's a big variation um but yeah i don't know is that something obviously you, you i think you got married to someone from the same neck of the woods so is that something you actively wanted to do or is that something it just sort of happened yeah, it is what I wanted to do. Um, I would say, uh, yeah, it was it was it was pretty much a specific choice because, mm. like we always say on the podcast, like obviously you want to base your marriage first and foremost on both having the same ambition uh, in terms of pleasing Allah and following His Sharia, mm. right? That's the first mm. thing. But you know, once you found that, once you decided on that, then the next stage, um, I believe, is finding someone like you said, like with the same culture slash values um and the mm. reason i think that's so important for your for the health of your marriage is because you're going to have certain assumptions of the for example the roles that you're going to take mm. and if you have a clash in those roles right you fundamentally weren't raised with the same roles uh, ideas mm. of roles then you can't really it's hard to fix it i feel because not fix but reconcile it because mm. i might think okay like Maybe in Algeria, you say, Aib for a man to go into the kitchen, even. Okay. Really? I you like might that. say that. Yeah. Some yeah, people yeah, have yeah. that, right? Yeah. Um, let's do that. We're okay. going to employ that. <laughs> so for me, let's say, for me, it, I can't be going to the kitchen at all. I will not do anything in the kitchen. Good. Um, now, the, why is that, though? Like, if my wife doesn't, wasn't raised with that idea, how can I explain to her logically in a convincing way that that is the right way to do it? I can't mm. because it's subjective, you know? Yeah. And so imagine you have so many things that you don't agree on and they're all subjective. You can't convince each other. Yeah, yeah. You're right so, there. Like, I remember, like, my... Uh, I don't know. She might listen to this and, and, and tell me off, but I'm sure this is what happened. <laughs> but I remember she was, like, sort of showing me off when I was went in the kitchen and started cooking something once. Like, it was an abnormal thing. Um, yeah. I don't do it all the time. But, like, I grew up with my parents, like, always in the kitchen together. Like, my dad would always cook. Like, there was... There were set days when my dad would just cook. I knew, like, I could tell what my dad had cooked. Not because it was bad, nothing like that, but, like, my dad would cook certain things. Mm. Um, you know, like, he liked to cook, like, spaghetti with with seafood, um, certain types of, like, malaka and stuff like that. Spice so and I, couscous. Oh, couscous with the bro. chili on the top. Bro, couscous. Tunisians bro. love spicy couscous. We had couscous with eels the other day, bro. Bang. Actually, I think Absolutely. that is a Tunisian thing. Uh, is it? Couscous with seafood, I mean. like. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, we don't, I've never seen that in Algeria. Oh, food. bro. Oh, it's so good. So good. I suggest you try it. Um, but yeah, food, bro. Like when I think culture, bro, it's just all, it all comes down to food for me. All right. That's, <laughs> the, that's the importance, you know, because I've realized, actually, you know, we sit there, she makes something. I, I understand what's on the table, right? I know what's going on here. I know what to expect. Um, there are vast differences, though. Like, I'll go to, you know, my in-laws and especially the Algerian um, family and they'll cook something and I'm just like, what is that? I don't understand what that is. That makes no sense to me. Um, I thought we were meant to be friends. <laughs> I thought we were meant to be friends here. <laughs> I, thought we, I thought we had an agreement. Um, so, yeah, there is there is that. But oh, So that, that's why I, I believe strongly in marrying for the same kind of value culture slash expectations whatever you want to call it because those things you can't necessarily convince the other one of it because it's subjective right so it's very mm. difficult um to deal with 
significant things that are different. Obviously, you're always going to have things that are different, no problem. Mm. Um, but yeah, so, but I'm thinking now, like, I kind of decided uh, growing up, like when I was forming my full identity, you know, from when you're, let's say, 16 till 22, three, you're kind of deciding who you're going to be, right? And yeah. who you identify as. And I decided in that time, I suppose, that I'm Algerian, right? Okay. And so because of that, it's quite easy for me to say, okay, I want to marry an Algerian or at least North African, you know, but I'm just thinking, you know, if somebody was way more mixed than me, um, it would be difficult, but I don't know, maybe you often have a, a base culture, like the sister writing this email sounds like her base thing is Moroccan, right? So mm. what I would, you know, maybe suggest is if you're like that, you marry someone who's from a Moroccan background or let's say North African background, because we can go wider and it's kind of similar, a North African background, but then also they have some level of influence from another culture, whether they're half this, or whether they've lived in that place for a long time, because you do definitely get a difference in culture from somebody who's been exposed to other cultures significantly compared yeah, yeah. to someone who's like only known one homogenous culture their whole life. Now yeah. that brings out something like, like for example, like if I, if I got married and like, okay, I'm Algerian, my wife's Algerian, and then she's not cooking Algerian foods, I might oh. be like put off by that. Yeah. I, I, might, I might find it very weird, for example. And I'm just giving a silly example of food because it's the first thing that comes to mind. But, um, but that's why is it normal if my, uh, let's say my Algerian wife makes spaghetti, that's normal for me. Why? Yeah. Because I'm already open in terms of culture to all these different things. So mm. I think... It's like, okay, someone who's, let's say, Moroccan, but they've got other influences. That sounds like some, someone that would fit another person who's Moroccan, but they have different influences. As long as they got that kind of open-mindedness or they're just mm. open, open to other things. And they don't have that thinking that there's only kind of one culture that's right and you should just live this way just because and stuff like that, basically. Mm. I do sometimes wonder though, bro, like what would happen if, you know, someone like you or I, we married someone from back home, like fully from back home. Would it work out or not? Um, I, I, I don't know if I know many marriages like that, so I, I don't know how it works out. Um, yeah, I think it would have been difficult, at least for me, bro. I think it would have been difficult because I do, I wouldn't say I associate with Tunisian culture more than mm. here, you know. I, I it, would, it would have always had to be somebody from the UK, bro. Um, mm. Because, uh, you know, 90% of the everything I'm, you do and the way I speak and the things I'm into and what interests me, blah, 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 all because of the environment I'm here, bro. And I think that's the one thing, like, you know, although I wouldn't, like, if someone asked me, are you British? I'd be, I'd, I'd have to think long and hard about it. I wouldn't yeah. even say I'm anything, bro. I can't say that I'm British. I can't say mm -hmm. that I'm Tunisian. I can't say that I'm Moroccan. You know, mm -hmm. I can't say it with confidence. I can't say I'm any of those things with confidence. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a testament to our social circles, actually. Like, you know, like me and you are friends because we've had the similar upbringing. All of my friends are the same thing. You know, they're either immigrants from different countries or they were born and raised here, but with very strong ties to wherever they're from. Um, you know, yeah, I, I don't, I just, I, I can't, I can't say I'm any of those things. So mm. it's, it's, it's hard to put a, a label on it. I mm. think ultimately what is interesting is that we always, um, <clears throat> what's the word? we you know birds of a feather flock together and it was that sort of notion you know i've spoke about it many times how growing up at school and stuff how you know i felt out of place because a lot of people knew what they were doing or who they were and then it wasn't until my teenage years that i started um especially the late teenage years i started associating with arabs or muslims that i realized oh they're also marginalized or they're also um, they've also got the same sort of experience of not really knowing where they're from and stuff. And that's mm -hmm. what unified us. And to be fair, it's an element that could unify the Ummah. Like in 50 years, bro, the Mesajid here are going to look very different to how they, they've looked for the previous 50 years, you know, because with time, Achi, you're not going to have this predominant sort of immigrant culture of, of individuals that are born and raised in, you know, Somalia, Pakistan, North Africa, all these places, and then come over here and settled here and brought a lot of baggage with them. Actually, in 50 years, bro, it's going to be like predominantly, we're going to be the elders, you know, and we are born and raised here. We have elements of our, you know, of, of the Muslim world within us, but the deen will be, I'd like, I'd like to think, the deen would be something that unifies us. And it would also be something that we haven't got much baggage with, 
we haven't got this baggage of like, no, we came from this neck of the woods. So this is how we're going to do this. You know, this is what we do for Eid and this is what we do for Ramadan. This is what we do mm. in terms There'd of... There'll be more you know, unity because you share more. Yeah. And also your, you, your only source for the deen is text as opposed to context, you know, mm. in that sense, like context being, oh, contextually I'm from, you know, this place. Uh, as opposed but now it'll be ideally it'd just be okay yeah they're gonna still be uh madahib and stuff um but also i think there should be a level of understanding that we know what we're doing in the ter- in the sense of uh, you know the dean and, and what we're t- where we're getting our sources from um, i'm trying to think of like somewhere like east london mosque where i was there uh last week and, you know, there's still elements of... Um, and the reason I'm talking about East London Mosque is because I saw a picture of when it was first established, like black and white photo, bro, and it was like proper, like, old-school immigrant community. Um, but, you know, okay, there's going to be a time where those people don't exist anymore, you know? There's not going to be people that live through some, you know, colonialism or live through that sort of uh, initial influx of immigrants that settled here and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just going to be offspring left. Now, you know, you still get elders, you still get that kind of... Uh, the people in charge, generally speaking, although it's phasing out a bit now, but generally speaking, are still elders of of Masjid and stuff. Um, but yeah, imagine, actually, imagine um, going into these communities now, and it's just people. You know, you, you it's rare that you find an accent because people have grown like the generations mm. have outgrown yeah. them. What does Islam look like for that? that sort mm. of community in that nation mm. um, i think there is still context though bro i think it's just the context is uk you know yeah of course that's what i mean but like yeah. you know for example like there are message it now actually that you go to and they're just they will just speak urdu for example yeah like, that'll be it yeah you know? that's probably going away yeah yeah like and, and there's there's a message that open so apparently there's a message that's open five minutes from me which is very strange because I live in a very small village. Um, so just next to me is another small little village town thing. There's a masjid there. And I was like, I don't even know any Muslims here. But yeah. apparently there is. So I, I've been meaning to go and visit it. Um, they haven't got any prayer times. It's more of a mosallah than a masjid. But from what I can hear, what I'm telling, what I can hear is like it's a very, it's either a Bangladeshi or a Pakistani community, um, something along those lines. So mm. I'm like, oh, is this, is this like the masjids that we have where, because I've been to Masjid, bro. And it's like, they do Arabic, but it's very, very quick sort of Arabic khutbah. And then it's just all Urdu or something yeah. like that. And I'm like, oh, bro, I'm like, man, <laughs> what's going on? Bro, I had, you know? and you know what it is as well? I, I went to a few times, went to a Masjid like that. And the khutbah is all in Urdu. And yeah. when we get up to pray, I've got the, uh, an uncle, he doesn't speak English at all, right? So he's just yanking on my leg pulling me towards where he wants me to stand you know (laughs) just pulling me there because he has no other way of communicating yeah um yeah man you know bro there's definitely a british muslim culture and you know it you know why the proof of that is when you go to medina go to Mm. medina and ask the students in the university there about the british the american students they have certain reputation yeah, know, yeah. because oh, no. they because they come with their culture in the end you know there is yeah. there is a british culture so but it's also like that now like you look at there's this notion i don't know how accurate it is but like we compare british islam with with the american islam yeah, yeah. um but the people's context of american islam is, is 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 a bit misguided i think because when people use the term american islam they're talking about like maybe very liberal, very loosey-goosey sort of thing. But I feel like when I think American Islam, I'm thinking like Mufti, bro. I'm thinking like that kind of, you know, I'm thinking about people that are actually quite firm and stuff. So it's quite bad that there's this, because because there's people, there's people in the UK, you know, without naming names, but there's obviously faces that represent the liberal side of, 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 of British Muslims, you know, and Mm. that exists quite predominantly. You see it on daytime TV. So I I don't see why that is something that's stuck. East, East coast versus West coast. American maybe. Islam, maybe bring back maybe. two pack in. That's another bro. thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing, though. Like America is a massive place. I think people underestimate how big it is. Yeah, like each state is like a country, so they've got their own laws and their own reg- regulations yeah. and all sorts. So, mm, yeah. Uh, final thing, bro, is she mentioned about raising kids? You raised your kid yet? I'm not done. 
Working not done. Progress. Come on, man. God. Yeah, I don't, it's taking longer erased. than I expected. Okay. Man. I shaved. I shaved Suleiman's head the other day. It looks absolutely shocking. His hair was getting too long. I didn't want to take him to the barbers. I did it myself, and uh, it's not happening again. That's what. I'm oh, not say. good results. Yeah, not good result. I'll show you, but he looks like he's just been. You know, what's the word? Uh, he's going to be deployed to like uh, mm. some sort of war somewhere, bro. <laughs> it looks. Wow. It looks like an absolute jarhead. <laughs> <laughs> you tried uh, to do a fade and failed. No, I just wanted to do like one length all over, but yeah. it just didn't. Anyway, okay. yeah. But you know what? It's part of growing up. You know, we've all had bad, bad haircuts. I'm you sure, know? yeah. Yeah. I, I think I have bad memories of haircuts. <laughs> then I used to start, then when I started going on my own to get haircuts, just the same thing, just shave it number three every single, whatever it is, couple of weeks. Mm. That's a culture that was weird to me. I don't know if you're with me still or not. Are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, this was weird for me. When I went to the UK, I found out there's this culture of like men who are actually bothered about their hair. And like they're like, yeah, I've got to I've got to get the fresh cut like a couple times a week. Uh, that yeah. was like completely alien to me. I was like, I, f- I found it quite feminine. Like, what the hell? But it's a big thing over there, isn't it? Like, Bro, yeah, you got to get the fresh, fresh fade. You got to get the get fresh fade trim. done and all that. Hey, no. yeah. oh, you know, the barbers that's... in UAE, they don't know what fade is. If really? you tell them fade, um, they don't do it because they don't really know what it is. Yeah. Oh, where did I? I got my hair cut in Dubai once mm. in 2008. That was a strange experience. Yeah, I was Indian delirious. Head, Indian head massage. Oh, I don't remember. Actually, like that whole trip, mm. I was very ill. Mm. So like the whole week was just like a dream. Oh. Like it's just I was just delirious, bro. Mm. So I don't really remember. Mm. Um, trying to think. Yeah, in, in in North Africa, they know what fades are. They oh, call it. 100%. They call it militaire. That's what they call it. Oh, in in Tunisia or Morocco. Or yeah, what? like a military fade. What do they call it in Algeria? I think they call it like uh, grada un, like uh, grada un. like uh, or they call it degradé, you know, like uh, faded basically. Degra- right? Yeah, de- degradation, decadence. <laughs> decadence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did I ever tell you about the story when I went to have a haircut in Morocco and um, I almost had a, an argument with the barber because I didn't realize I was speaking Tunisian instead of Moroccan, and he just couldn't. Oh. Uh, so I like I kept asking. Did him you how come much... and call him empty, and he got no. offended? <laughs> I I was asking him how much it was, and I kept saying "bagadesh," mm. which is what we say in Tunisian. Yeah, but I completely forgot that. Obviously, in Morocco they say "bshal," mm. and he just kept saying "what," and I was like, "You." You taking a mic? And we just started arguing. I was getting so frustrated. I was like, is he is he taking the mic out of me? And then I realized in the end, as I left, we eventually like understood. But then as I left, I was like, oh, it's my fault. I was speaking the wrong language. <laughs> um we, we, we've gone on a tangent here. Uh kids, that's what it was. Yeah. How to raise kids. Uh what the thing, how to raise kids. That'd be a good book. Um culture subhanallah i don't know bro. i've got this fear that it's not going to really carry over that much because um what are we now third generation yeah bro they're going to have much to go for like i just need to accept that no matter how hard i try it's just going to be the food that's all that's going to last mm. <laughs> you know like what what else can i do unless i send them over there like it was we're quite fortunate to have what we have only because we've lived in um you know i spent a couple of years in, in tunisia and i go there every summer yeah you know? and that's that's the best i could hope for for my kids is to just take them frequently yeah um, you know, for long periods of time but even like it's hard actually like i was quite fortunate that my parents my parents you know were able to do so but like now you know, now you're that I'm to working, get vaccinated to go. Not just that, actually. Like even, like we used to go actually for like all summer. Yeah, we used yeah. to go for like six weeks. It's a lot you know, of time or, to take off. Or two, yeah, two months. Like you can't do that nowadays. Like I, I know I can't do that at work. There's no way I could take that much time off at work. Um, you know, maybe a week, maybe two weeks maximum. Yeah. But unless you're in a in a in a um, you know a financial situation that can mm. or some sort of job that allows you to do so. Um, yeah. 
and, and even your kids bro like if you i don't know how long you're going to be in turkey for maybe this is a long-term thing whatever but imagine like your kids are just going to be like those typical expat children they're just like bougie bro like always 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 globe trying where are we going for uni <laughs> yeah man it, it's tricky it's like when you go to the bread aisle in the uk and there's like 20 types of bread and you're just like i want bread too many <laughs> options it's, <laughs> it's the paradox that, bro what the hell is 50 50 50 oh, we always get 50 50 i have to get 50 50 yeah the reason why is because i prefer brown bread yeah and i think my wife grew up with with white bread but she she mm. We both bought into the, the the propaganda that brown bread is better for you, so we've gone <laughs> we go for the fifty fifty because it's the only way we can trick our son. But to be honest, it doesn't actually matter because both breads are pretty much the same thing. You Neither know? of you are happy then. Neither no. of you got what you wanted. <laughs> it's better than one person being happy and the other person not because mm. then there's some hazard there. But if we're both suffering, it's fine. <laughs> Equal, equality, <laughs> at least. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't really touch a white bread. Like it, 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 sometimes if I eat, you know, the really cheap white bread in the UK, if I eat that, I might feel sick. Cause it, it just, it's like nothingness. It's like paper. Oh, it's I like, like it. it's too processed. Um, I like getting like proper bread, bro. Like that's, you know, scratch that. My wife started making bread at home. That's Amazing. really good. Yeah. That's oh, really that's, good. That's, the, that's the way forward. Then you know what's in it because even like you said, like the brown bread, Sometimes it's just like white bread, but with coloring. Um, mm. Sometimes there's a bit of grain, but if you make it yourself, you know how much fiber is going in there. You know that mm. there's no bleach uh, in it because you know they put oh, bleach so in good. it, so you know yeah. preservative, so it lasts longer. All of this yeah. stuff. So homemade bread is definitely the one. Um, what we're saying about raising kids, yeah, you know, um, I I believe I I think so far because I've got a long. Uh, a long road ahead of me kids wise so we'll see what i think later but i think my choice like i said in deciding i would identify as algerian i feel that kind of helped me it helped me to to kind of just narrow down the options <laughs> okay yeah so um like it helped me to decide that i should marry an algerian you know or it helped me to decide okay kind of like what what i'm going to do for my wedding or whatever all that okay, uh, invest in learning to speak Algerians. And now, now that means I can speak to my in-laws like in Algerian and all of these things. So it's, it's quite helpful. So mm. I think for my kids' sake, um, my kids are actually going to be less mixed than me. So uh, I can tell my kids, inshallah, that you're Algerian. Oh, I guess so, so they yeah. Can, they can have that, um, that identity. But then obviously just how I was raised, I was raised very kind of open-minded where it's like, okay, you're Algerian and this and that you know about your, the history and you know these things yeah. but it's like like for example my dad never like forced me to study anything specific he just uh -huh. focused on like just study hard work hard the main thing is work ethic so i was already kind of had that like open kind of freedom kind of thing so i'll, I'll keep that openness up but uh, just i think it's healthy for, to have some level of identity of you're from xyz yeah. you know uh, it's very difficult man like growing up in uae or turkey or whatever and not being from that place yeah it's like you don't know who you are and you need some answer to that question i think and humans have always had an answer and now you're kind of like um where am i from uh, yeah i think i underestimate how mixed my kids are like i was uh, for example, like the, the one big thing I underestimate is like that quarter of them that is that is English, you know, and I, even my wife doesn't my wife doesn't um, associate with English culture a lot, but I will force her to nowadays because I'll see something on TV and I'll be like, oh, like it'll be like some black and white, like or some old Victorian thing. I'll be like, oh, look, that's your that's your great granddad. Mm. <laughs> when before, bro. Like, I've never associated with British culture. Like, mm. you know, like all the medieval stuff, bro, and the castles and the king. Bro, I'm not interested in that stuff. But now, like, I'll force myself to be because I'm like, you know what? My son might look at that and think that's some of his heritage there. Mm. You know, in the same way that I look at, like, Bedouins and, and you know, nomads mm. and stuff in North Africa and camels and stuff. And I'm like, oh, yo, those are my people. Like, my son is going <laughs> to, my son's going to see some stuff like that. Mm. You know, like, that, you know, all that groggy sort of, like, medieval, like, knights and soldiers and, <laughs> Ah. vomiting over the top of the castle and oh bro can you imagine yeah like flipping eating like a eating like that no he wouldn't be eating the pork but like you know they got those table spreads and having a feast bro and it's like 
the Black Plague or whatever they call yeah. it, the Black Death and all of that. Ah, oh, <laughs> the Tudors and Shakespeare. Bro, he's gonna like look at Shakespeare and be like, "Yo, that's my guy." I'm like, "That's not your guy." <laughs> <laughs> my dad used to say that Shakespeare was Arab, bro. He used to say he was Sheikh Zubair. Sheikh Zubair, yeah. Have you seen that video on YouTube where the the Shi'i Imam guy he's saying that? Uh, San Jose, you know, San Jose in California is basically where oh, yeah. Silicon Valley is. Okay? All right. And he said, San Jose, the place where all this technology came from, it actually comes from Arabic, Saint, Yanni, San Hussein. Oh, yeah? And he's course. like, Yanni, Quddus Hussein, Yanni, the, the Saint Hussein or the right. Holy Hussein. And he's like, oh, you know, trying to claim it. <laughs> I'm it's like, dude, that's time. Spanish, man. <laughs> it's Spanish, bro. Oh. Uh, Jose actually is Spanish for Yusuf, isn't it? Or Joseph. So Jose. Jose. <laughs> he got that completely wrong. <laughs> but yeah, bro, I don't know, man. I think by the time my kids like growing up and they're more conscious of culture and these things, many, many people will be mixed. It depends where I am. You know, if I'm in like if I'm in Turkey, like Turkey's like it's just hundred homogenous culture, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like if you're not Turkish, Turkish, you're kind of weird here. But there are decent amount of Arabs in the area I'm in. I met a guy yeah. the other day. He's Egyptian, but he he uh, lived in Turkey now for 12 years. He basically grew up in Turkey. And yeah. he said, you know, I speak Turkish. I've got the citizenship. But uh, because I don't look Turkish, I can never be fully Turkish. Hmm. Um, and he was saying, you know, like, but the Syrians here, they speak perfect Turkish. They look Turkish, so they can, if they don't bring it up, they could be, you know, accepted as, as Turkish. Hmm. So as for me, I think I could be Turkish potentially. So I just need to Mashallah. learn the language. Wow. I like that. That's good. <laughs> That's really great. Um, oh. But yeah, I don't know exactly where my kids will be, but I think I'm not, I'm not like too worried about it because I feel like so many people are going to be like this. And uh, yeah. like, like Turkish kids are all watching. Um, what's that big YouTuber these days, Mr. Beast and all this rubbish yeah uh they're they're watching all this stuff they're being it being influenced by so many different things so oh bro i just different. i just realized that mm. our kids are going to be like youtube generation bro like well, but like oh i can't deal with kids you know i banned youtube you know no more youtube for my kids bro my son used to watch it all the time mm. and now now i tell him it's broken tell it because it used to be i used to have the xbox and i got rid mm. of that and now he doesn't know how to work the PlayStation. So it's like, he doesn't, he doesn't know YouTube mm. for him. That's and I something, like that. something I want in my house culture and he has no TV. So like, I don't want to have a TV in the house. I don't want to see, I don't want to grow up. This is difficult because like, for me, mm. I know how I grew up. Right. And I'd like to think that I turned out okay, but there was, you know, it took a long time to get to where I'm at, you know? Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, I didn't, wasn't born, like raised practicing that sort of thing. Mm. So, but, but at the same time, I don't want to be like, uh, I don't want to put all these things that I was never, I never got raised with because then, because yeah. I know kids you've are changed, smart, bro. Because they'll ask me. so many variables. So you don't know what yeah. the outcome is going to be. Yeah. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. So I'm relative, I'm keeping his sort of upbringing relatively similar to mine, yeah. but with more Islam yeah. Yeah, in yeah. it than I what remember having. What you consider normal, yeah. Yeah, so like I'm, you know, we sit down, we speak about like we've got loads of Islamic books, like kids' books and stuff. We'll go through all that stuff. I'll make him pray with me, and we'll speak about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala together. These kind of things, which you know, I remember my mum doing with me, and I'm trying to do a bit more than that. But also, I'm giving him access to a lot of things that you know that I normally had growing up as well. And mm -hmm. reason being, because I, I know kids are smart, bro, because I remember what it was like for me. And I know that I don't want him turning around one day and being like, hey, but I found out that you used to do this and this and this. You know you know what I mean? Because that will happen. Like your your parents will say that to your kids without even reading to, oh, I remember when your dad was your age, blah, blah, blah. And, and they come out and then you'll feel, kid will, kid will, kids will feel betrayed, bro. And that's the last thing I want. I don't want mm. my kids feeling like I've betrayed them or something like that. Mm. Um, and also I'm very conscious about um, too much control. So there was like this thing that I kept realizing in, at least in the city that I lived, the parents that were very practicing that I used to be like, I used to be like, oh, you know, obviously my dad, alhamdulillah, he's praying and stuff now. But if, when I was growing up, I was like, oh, I wish my dad would do that. Their kids were like reckless, bro. They were wild. Mm. But then the kids were, the, the ones that parents were a bit like not very practicing or didn't mm. care. Their, their, their kids were really sort of, 
on in the masjid and on mm. deen and stuff and that clash kind of scared me because i thought yeah. oh if i'm the practicing parent mm. does that mean my kids are gonna be like wild and run loose i don't want to have that yeah. so i was trying to think i was trying to identify what it was about these kids that they, they weren't um receptive to their parents and what i could obviously i can't live with them to see but yeah. what i could at least observe from a distance was like their their parents were quite strict you know and quite um like the dean was very like it wasn't something made in not fun but like enjoyable or receptive or whatever enforced. it was quite orders yeah. it was quite enforced and stuff mm. so i'm trying to focus yeah. mainly on just having a fun and energetic relationship with yeah. my kids and yeah, then I like agree, bro yeah yeah and i think the TV thing about is, the dean you know if i was to get a tv it would actually it wouldn't be for me it wouldn't be for my wife so then it would be for my son because you know i'm you're not, you're not going to buy a tv for your son are you so yeah um, that's why it's it's not a fake thing for me. It's natural that I wouldn't get a TV. But, but, but I agree the, with you, man. This is the issue. I mean, we are, we're already falling into that pro that thing that we didn't realize we we're going to be falling into. Like, okay. I don't know how you see yourself, but mm. I always saw myself as like, oh, I'm I'm up to date. Like, I'm about I'm about what it is right now. Like, this is it. I'm like my parents were a bit technophobic or whatever, mm. but. I know what my kids are going to be into. Well, we've already we've already missed the mark because we're talking about TVs when actually it's not even TVs now that people are doing stuff on. The internet is the predominantly the main source of entertainment and the yeah, main source yeah. of material and content. So how like in this day and age, saying you don't have a TV is pointless. It doesn't mean much. A computer yeah. and a laptop and a phone that you can yeah, just grab and go on 100%. YouTube. And, and I, that's what I need to remember. Like I grew I'm up thinking just not getting a TV, a TV was... to save money, bro. That's... Yeah, well, <laughs> but this is it. Like it's, you know, like, okay, I've got one of these things. Yeah. This is his. What is um, that? This is like an Amazon tablet. It came from okay. Amazon. Yeah. And it's, can I turn it on? We're doing the kids reviews now. Look at us. Look at that. Oh, product placement. <laughs> Where's the unboxing, bro? I want the unboxing. Oh, bro. Um, but this is quite, uh, what's the word? The thing is, with, with stuff like this that are made for kids, they're already quite... Um, locked down. Locked down. And, uh, but also, I mean, it's more locked down than just having open access to YouTube and searching whatever you want and then having that algorithm absolutely destroy you. Yeah. Like, bro, I, I walked in here once, and he's just watching some, like, alien, like, dancing. And I was, and he was copying the dancers. I was like, right, that's it. It's over. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> because for some reason, like, this is without even him... Uh, changing anything like it just auto plays yeah. so like you put on like something islamic which there are a lot you yeah. know alhamdulillah there are a lot of you know islamic alternatives but then somehow that youtube algorithm bro it would just it would just start seducing him into some weird like oh bro so uh, a lot a lot knows best a lot knows best so what does that, that do does it I'm allow them to... to watch youtube but not uh so i think it does have some sort of youtube thing youtube kids it, but... i think there's a yeah YouTube. but it's but it's only like tailored content. To yeah. be honest, I want to remove it completely because I still don't really know. Yeah. But oh, I'm trying to. It's a very slow and and, um, and thingy um, device. I'll teach quite, him patience. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's just very tailored. Like you can only watch certain game. You can only play certain games on here. Yeah. Uh, educational stuff and like you can have books on here. So he's got a lot of dinosaur books. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. But I would want I want something that. I can tailor completely. There's a lot of is um, there's a lot of new and upcoming like uh, Islamic sort of gift um, games and stuff, but they're not on this. I think mm -hmm. they're more for like iPads and stuff like that. Yeah. And this was this was very cheap. I can't remember how much it was. It's was quite cheap. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to fork out a fortune for an iPad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he enjoys this, bro. He'll play it on some, sometimes. He'll play it and then he'll leave yeah. it and then he'll go and play with his toys and yeah. he'll go read a book and then mm. he'll. Do you know what I mean? Maybe the alternative to being that controlling parent is creating so many opportunities for your kids to have fun in a way that you would you'll be completely happy with you know mm. so like and this is why like the community you're with is so important because you know stuff like scouts um there are scouts all over the world you know there's like yeah. there's in algeria the scouts in england the scouts there's, there's you know muslim scouts really good so stuff like scouts stuff like playing football in the street like, I really mm. want my kids to have that to do so they don't feel deprived of TV or iPad yeah. or anything like that. I want them to have a very full life of activities. And, you know, and then again, I don't want them to be completely alienated from stuff like YouTube, right? But I just want them maybe, maybe they'll engage with YouTube when they're at a friend's house, for example, you know, rather right. than having access to it at home. That So I want them to know about it and... 
and have that kind of normal thing that you were talking about. But maybe I'm hoping that if I can give them so many opportunities to do stuff, especially if they can have like friends and activities in walking distance from the home or without relying on me to take them everywhere, mm. then that would be ideal, you know. Uh, but let's see where, where I end up and what is available. But that would be a big, you know, reason for me choosing where to live is if there are these kind of things. Yeah. And sometimes you got, you got to create them as well. Right? Yeah. I remember obviously before I had kids, I had all these grand ideas of what I would do and what, and a lot of them have just fallen by the wayside because it is mm. very difficult. You know, it's hard it to is, yeah. keep that consistent thought process. Mm. And, you know, sometimes you're absolutely smashed, bro. Sometimes yeah, you're knackered exactly. and you've got no choice but to let them, you know, watch something or put yeah. something on or whatever. That's true. Um, so, yeah, and that's why, like, sometimes you hear some people giving, uh, you know, parental advice and they haven't even got kids yet and that annoys me because i'm like oh you, mm. you you just stick to your lane you <laughs> yeah, know yeah. Don't you start telling me what to do bro. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. um but, it but it, it's it still is. it's still early days but i think no, you know, there, are, there are two things that really if i was thinking about the other day bro like the level that they influence where you live is insane mm. where mm. you work and and the fact that your kids are in a school or you want them to be in a specific school, yeah. these two things will literally dictate 90% of where you live. Mm. So, you know, if you, I was thinking, okay, if you run a business rather than a job and you you homeschool your kids, those two, you know, chains have been broken and mm. you can kind of go wherever. So True. it's, it's nice to aim for that. Maybe. I mean, again, yeah. then, then you've got the question of, okay, but is homeschooling even the best? And all that's all other discussion. True. But, yeah. True. I mean, we've got to now. We this month we have to put like start looking at schools um, to put him in if we were if we're going down that route uh, so that he can go to start next in September. Year. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, something like that. Mm. So I'm like, oh my god, this came really quick. I didn't realize how quick it's yeah. come. You know, he was born yesterday. What's what was going on? <laughs> yeah. um, Subhanallah. And like, it's clueless, especially if you don't have a community that you can sort of speak to. Like, I don't know anyone else with kids in this area. Mm. So I have no idea what schools are good. I don't know what, like, it came up with a list. We looked at the council website and it came up with like a list of all these schools. And it's like, which ones do you want to go to? I was like, is that it? Like, you're mm. just going to give me the names. It's like, I don't know what what they're about. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like, how are you gonna... I, I haven't got time to sort There's of There's no Amazon and... reviews for schools. Yeah, bro. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, there are, you know, all I did was I Googled top yeah. 10 schools in 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 this city and then i started looking if any of these ones that were close to us were on that list yeah. and i was like oh look, look there's one let's <laughs> have a look at that one so you know but i'm just basing that off some random top 10 list um yeah bro and there's like a lot of them are religious schools well they say religious a lot of them are like catholic schools around here yeah. and you know what when i was when i first came to the uk i remember mm -hmm. they were looking for schools for us my parents and they were like oh it's a catholic school no no, no we'll avoid that We'll go for something else but now i'm like the complete opposite i'm like oh it's a catholic school that's probably pretty good <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah, bro the dynamics have shifted so much like at this stage and a lot a lot is best i'm just sort of observing from a you know very very early stages but i'm thinking oh maybe him going to a catholic school is probably better off in the long run because at least they're going to have some values that i'm going to adhere to yeah and then like the, the 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 other elements of being in a catholic school i can sort of navigate through that and i can yeah um, I can teach him that because I'm going to do that anyway. You yeah. know? So what would I rather, what was my, what would my battle rather be? Would my battle be, Oh, look, they mentioned Jesus in school today. Yeah. But this is what we believe about Jesus. Okay. So we've got similar pages to, um, you know, mm. let's not even go into the other side of the spectrum, but you, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what yeah. battles? Subhanallah. Yeah. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be, it'd be interesting to know like how Christian are Christian schools these days because um, mm. some of them might just be literally like mainstream mainstream ones you know true i mean yeah. i think i must have been at a catholic school when i was in nursery or something like that because i've got these like memories of like singing hymns in school and mm. and like doing plays about um i don't know i was a shepherd in a play so it must have been some sort of religious thing mm. i'm sure it was um but at the same time schools now have changed so much to when I was there, especially like even secondary school when I was in college. Like the stuff I'm hearing about schools now is insane. The stuff that they teach, the stuff that's acceptable, the, the, the stuff that is prevalent within the students themselves that didn't that hardly existed back then. Mm. 
Yeah, it's crazy. So I think it's it, it's it'd be good to. Um, I mean, I don't think you're going down that route anyway, are you? I don't know if you're putting them in school in Turkey. I suppose you could. It's too early. Uh, obviously, I've got years and years before my son's going to be at that thing. Oh, that you stage. say it, bro. You say years and years, and before you know it, it's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, uh, I doubt it. Uh, you know, I very much doubt it, to be honest. I think I, do, I, don't, I don't really, not fully convinced about pure homeschooling either. Um, mm. I think a mixture of uh, homeschooling, tutoring, maybe micro right. school, you know, that this concept of like five, for example, five families having a teacher for five kids, yeah. in a class, you know, the, make your own school kind of thing. Yeah. Um, sounds good. So, yeah. Just teach him, bro. Just teach him the entrepreneur lifestyle, bro. That's all he needs to do, bro. Teach him about the stock market, bro. <laughs> Tell him this is how you trade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's rule bro, number man. one. Buy rule Tesla. One. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> oh man. Oh, subhanallah. Did you did you have any slack? Because they just announced that they're being acquired. No. no. I don't think I did. No. Shame. No. You, you should have called that. I should have known it. Okay, bro. Listen, yeah. <laughs> join join my group chat, here. bro. We got like we got like how many people we got in this group chat? We got like forty to fifty people in this group chat, bro. With more people, like, mashallah, bro, mashallah. It's, it's I was just nice. thinking, bro. You know, like, I was actually thinking of, of, of this stuff. Yeah, I was like, fifty-one. Go if on. I put a thousand pounds into stocks, yeah, even if I double my money, I've only made a thousand pound. Like, yeah, but you're not you're not gonna put a thousand pounds and then you're gonna walk away. You're just gonna keep putting bits in there every every week, every month, you know. Mm. And no, then maybe. it's. And then what? Once you you made what you, you made a hundred percent on your first year, but then if you make a hundred percent your second year, that's a hundred percent of two two thousand, not a hundred percent of one thousand. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So that's. I mean, that's, I, yeah, it's just I always thought of the index fund thing where you just put it in a mixture of things and it'll definitely go up on average. But yeah. like for, as a Muslim, we can't really do that, I suppose. You can make your own. So what I've done is, I've actually made my own, bro. Can you imagine? But. What I'll do is I'll go through an index fund. I'll monitor an index fund, for example, and I'll I'll scan it through all the companies that are on there and buy wow. so the whatever ones that Sharia. Are you take them out. Okay, yeah. that's clever. And then, okay, I'll, I like and then I'll and then I'll the ones that I like the look of, I'll invest in them and then I'll keep monitoring what they're buying, oh. what they're selling, and I'll Sweet. just sort of emulate that every week. Okay, good. Um so that's good. quite a good way of doing it. Like there's one I follow. Um there's one that I follow that have an average of like 30% a year mm. annual returns. Mm. Um, but yeah, a lot of the stuff they've picked has been really great. And I look into it. Some stuff obviously is not permissible, so I don't, I don't mm. touch them. Do you said you pay is. for Zoya, right? You've got a pro account. Yeah, yeah, bro. I pay for them partly because I find it, it's a really useful and quick and easy tool to mm. use, but also because like any sort of uh, Muslim initiative in a field that I am interested in, I like to support mm. it. You yeah. know, like there's kids shows that I don't even like there's kids shows, Muslim kids shows that we don't even have access to anymore because um, like he hasn't got YouTube or whatever. But I still keep that de direct debit going because I want to support that. Yeah. And the same with Zoya. Like, to be honest, I don't need Zoya that much because I kind of know what I'm doing in that element of it. But I'll still pay, bro, because mm. I want I want to support that because I am yeah. I use it and I'm mm. uh, so certain things. Yeah, certain things. Like, I, like, I, I, mm. No, alhamdulillah. I'm, oh, no, now it sounds like I'm showing off. No, I didn't mean that. Uh, forget we had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, going back Come to on, the bro. parenting thing. Um, what was I, I was, was I going to say? You were going to teach him how to be a Facebook marketer <laughs> at six years old. Then you can have him on Forbes for being the youngest marketer on the world. And then, bro, <laughs> let's just sort it, Aki. All right? <laughs> yeah. Can't remember, bro, but. Anyway, I think, yeah, like culture-wise, it's going to be mixed. Um, I think I, I'm not too bothered about, as long as the values are Islamic values and they mm. have some level of sense of identity that generally I'm from like this place, part of the world, my history is this history, then even if all the rest is like influences from all over the world, like should be all right. Um, mm. it's, not, it's not avoidable, man. It's not avoidable unless, for example, if I went to live in Algeria, then I could like just 100 percent. Maybe I can't be Algerian, but my kids might be able to just be raised and just be like fully Algerian. 
maybe that would happen. But even in Algeria, like it's globalization is touching everywhere, man. So uh, maybe it's completely unavoidable. So not really kind of worried about that uh, per se. Um, yeah. So we will end it there, I think. Good. I like these, bro. I like emails, man. I like this engagement with our audience, you know? We've still got a lot of, um, what's the word? Curious cat stuff to go Oh, through. we do, yeah? Okay, that's nice. Because this email was the only unread one, so we, we've uh, now dealt with it. So uh, we've, we've kind of cleaned out the emails. But guys, listen to us. Listen. Ooh. Inshallah, in a couple of weeks, we will do episode 100. We'll try and do it live on YouTube with pure audience interaction. So we'll just come on. Whoa. Obviously, we can chat. We can chat. All while five we're of you. Yeah, but please come on. <laughs> and, uh, please come on and give us your raw input, your feedback, or your questions, or just topics for us to talk about. And you know, who knows? Maybe we do a marathon, bro. Maybe we can do like a three-hour episode or something. Uh, something special for episode one hundred. And uh, yeah, so just keep an eye out for that. I'm just saying that now because we need the audience to be live. Obviously, if we're going to do a live one, uh, keep your eyes open. Maybe not this exact next week, but maybe a couple of weeks time. And yeah, uh, thanks for being here on the journey of 99 episodes, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And uh, yeah, man, good episode, solid episode. And we'll end it there, inshallah. Yeah, of course, go to mindhighestpodcast.com if uh, you want to contact us. There are multiple ways to contact us and listen to the old episodes, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shadu wa na'ala wa ta'astaghfirullah wa ta'astaghfirullah wa ta'astaghfirullah wa ta'astaghfirullah wa ta'astaghfirullah wa ta'astaghfirullah wa